So way back in 1997, William Strauss and Neil Howe published this book called The Fourth Turning. Can you see this? Is it flipped for you? This book basically proposes a cyclical view of history rather than a linear view of history. Well, what does that mean? It basically means that history repeats. Rather than going in a straight line from bad or unevolved to evolved, it kind of goes like this, up and down, up and down. History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. Mark Twain said that. So it's similar to that view, that history goes in these cycles rather than just we're evolving to a certain point. Because we're evolving to a certain point can kind of get, it's not dehumanizing, Makes you feel hopeless though, because it's like, well, we're not at the end of history, despite whatever all of these academics from the 90s would have you believe, we're not at the end of history. We are part of history. Not to pick on Francis Fukuyama, the end of history was a popular assumption for a long time. You know, over the last few months, for the first time in my life, um, civil war as a possibility seems real. And I always thought I saw myself as existing outside of history. And so to now suddenly feel like, hey, this is deeply uncomfortable where this is headed. Silly rabbit. So if you think of history in a linear fashion, then you start to think, well, what am I? I'll never see the peak of history. I'll never see what it all comes down to. When we start to go into the history as a, a cyclical thing, then we think, well, we all have our part to play. So, so it is really cool. And no, these views of history, the linear view of history, which we have all grown up believing, or at least being taught, versus the cyclical view of history are not contradictory. Because watch this. Get a straight edge. because Linear view of history. See this? Straight line. Cyclical view of history. Now. They may seem contradictory, but look at this. Boom, makes perfect sense. I see in editing that my chart was not a complete explanation. Basically, the course of human history can fluctuate, but still track up. Now, back to scene, me thinking I have just killed this analysis. Although I appreciate this new cyclical view of history, it is a bold claim. It is a very bold claim. Because you say, well, one thing is built on another thing. How can we have a cyclical view of history? We're not going back to serfdom, are we? We're kind of going back to serfdom. <laughs> 2021, we're all kind of going back to serfdom, but not literally. We're not literally in a fiefdom somewhere too scared to go into the wilderness. So we are sort of advancing. We are 24 years out of the publication of this book. We have the benefit of hindsight. We can look back at these two dudes' claims, Strauss and Howe, and mock them for not knowing what we know. Ha ha, we have 24 years of knowledge up here. Actually, in here. We don't actually have it up here, do we? <laughs> Everything is in here. If this went away, would we know anything? That is beside the point. Actually, if I had made this video last year, I could have used the hindsight is 2020 meme. I could be like the Tokyo Olympics and just pretend it's 2020, even though it's clearly 2021, but that's a little shady. I have a feeling they did that in Tokyo just so they wouldn't have to reprint the merch. I'm not sure, but that is a long way to go to just save your merch money. I get it. I get it, but nevertheless. How are you gonna hold the Olympics in 2021 and call it 2020? We certainly are at a crisis period. <laughs> Everything is topsy-turvy if you're gonna hold the Olympics in 2021 and still keep the 2020 merch. That is beside the point. We're moving on to the context of this book and these ideas. Basically, the authors claim that history repeats in these intervals called seculum. Seculum. And those intervals, those seculum, are 80 years. Now, what is the significance of 80 years? It's about as long as a person's lifetime, as a long-lived lifetime. It's very interesting because they say, well, back in the day, the average lifespan, it was 25, it was 30, all this stuff. That is not true. If a person made it past five years old, past seven years old, those troubled childhood years where anything could take you out, dysentery, whatever, 
they could live a very long time. And 80 years was about that span. And we mentioned this in the video, How Will I Be Remembered? That as soon as the generation that learned the lesson dies out and they're not there to warn us about what went down when they were kids, what went down when they were younger, then all of a sudden we repeat those mistakes. Like clockwork. Don't ask why. No, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, we wrote it down, but we're gonna do it again. In this seculum, in this 80 year period, there are four generations. A generation being born about once every 20 years, which is how long it takes us to reproduce, or how long it took us to reproduce before we had birth control birth control being one of those technological advancements that makes history seem linear. But like I said, as we see from the card, irrefutable evidence, this card, which I don't even know if you can see it. Basically, the two do not have to be mutually exclusive. So four generations, what are they? We have the heroes in the last seculum. This is the GI generation or the greatest generation. It's my grandpa's generation. They solved things, they held it down, they established a status quo which benefited their society, heroes. The artists were the silent generation. Why were they called the silent generation? I have a theory, and that theory is that every single time someone in the silent generation spoke up to say something, a GI would be like, excuse me, I thought someone who didn't beat the Nazis tried to say something. And then the silent generation would be like, oh, I did not try to say anything. I'm sorry. I know you beat the Nazis. <laughs> You're so cool. So that's why they were the silent generation. They were expected to say, stay silent. And that's interesting for my grandpa too, because when he got back from the war, he got the GI Bill. And the GI Bill basically said that, yes, you were born as a poor kid in Boston, but you can be whatever you want to be as long as you you can be whatever you want to be, white man, and you can go to university and you can get your doctorate degree and you can get a house in the suburbs and with a white picket fence and a dog and 2.1 kid. They were much older when they were in university. So the silent generation, your grandparents, they were too young to fight in World War II. Now, that's not to say that the silent generation did absolutely nothing. The silent generation fought in Korea, the Korean War, which was in the early 1950s. But everybody knew that the Korean War was not World War II. And the Korean War, even though to us now, that would be considered a major war, but to them, and especially to the GI generation, the Korean War, that wasn't anything. Think about this. If you have watched Mad Men, uh, and I highly recommend you watch Mad Men, Don Draper was from the silent generation, whereas Sterling was a GI. I love Sterling. I love the character of Sterling. And we know he was a GI from that um, episode where they were doing business with the Japanese and Sterling just could not stand to be around them. He was being really racist. You kind of had to understand that he had been at war with the Japanese and that sort of colored his thinking. And it's unfortunate that there was this racism in that episode and in that generation, but Don Draper, his memories were of the Korean War. If you have living grandparents, they're probably silent generation. The silent generation, they were born in about 1929 to, it differs. Some people say 46 is when the boomers started to be born. Other people, like in this other book that I'm reading called A Generation of Sociopaths, I do not hold to the view that the boomers were a generation of sociopaths. I just happen to be reading the book. They claim that the boomers started to be born in 1940. Regardless, the silent generation is that generation that was born during the depression. Boomers are the next up. They are the prophets. We'll call them prophets. You can have goofy prophets too. I personally consider the boomers to be a goofy generation. They are, according to Strauss and Howe, prophets. It's fine and they were born between 1946 and 1963. We'll get into what happened in 63 in just a minute. Then the fourth generation, the nomad generation, Strauss and Howe called them the 13th generation. They call them the 13th, but we referred to them as Gen Xers. Uh, they're they're called nomads because they don't really have a place. They're kind of wandering. They are the most belittled of the generations even though the previous nomad generation, the lost generation was actually quite generous. So just FYI, they're called nomads and they tend to be the black sheep generation, 
but in reality, they do contribute a lot to us. Now, what happened in 1980? Well, it all repeats again. So the new heroes started to be born. Who are the new heroes? Right here, right here. Millennials. Don't laugh. I laughed too when someone told me that. <laughs> I was like, we're, we're the heroes, really? And then I told him this is my friend, a good friend, this girl. And we're having lunch. I said, look, we're supposed to be the next hero generation. And she burst out laughing. She spit her margarita, which was definitely unkind considering it's COVID and everything. Although, anyway, she spit her margarita. She was like, we're the heroes. I'm like, girl, we are supposed to be the heroes. So maybe it's a goofy seculum. I'm always saying this. I'm always saying this about the United States in 2021 is we are an unserious goofy ass people and if the millennials are the heroes well that's just the icing on the cake that's just the icing on the cake i'm not saying i dispute it i'm just saying how many millennials have you met we're gonna have to put the bong down if we're gonna be heroes that's all i'm saying anyway now we have four generations we have the heroes we have the artists we have the prophets and we have the nomads and we have four periods in the seculum. So we have the high. Now, the high in the last seculum was 1946 to about 1963. What happened then? America was booming. America was absolutely booming. We were the last man standing after the Second World War. We had that cash. We had that cash. Oh, when people say they want to make America great again, they're talking about this period. White picket fences. People had jobs, two parents in one household and one income so people could stay at home. Mothers could stay at home. Mothers could stay at home and raise the children. There was definitely a dark side to this, but we will go into that in a minute. And so in 1963, you know what happened if you were alive then. Those of us who were not alive do not understand the significance of 1963, but that's when Kennedy was assassinated. Kennedy was the hero prince. He was a war hero. He had a beautiful wife, beautiful family, just absolutely perfect. And people were horribly traumatized by what happened, his assassination. RIP JFK. The next stage in the last seculum was the awakening. And so this was the new age awakening. Tune in, turn on and drop out. Tune in, turn up, and drop out. Are we supposed to tune in and turn up and then drop out? I think that's what millennials are doing, but I, I don't think we're supposed to be turning up. Hmm. It's much more spiritual than that. People were doing LSD. This was a spiritual time when they, I don't say rejected, but they pushed back on that materialistic view of the high being the period in which their parents built this massive economy for them and pushed back on that and said there's more to life than just white picket fences and a happy home there's also the spirit there's also discovering why we're here as much as i like to mock the boomers and i do like to mock the boomers and i will be mocking the boomers a lot on this channel in the future um i do also have to credit them with the spiritual awakening of the 1960s the awakening is sort of the shadow of the crisis the crisis the crisis period, basically from the stock market crash until the end of the world war, that was just chaos. There was just chaos. What the GI generation grew up in and came of age in is absolute chaos. They had a stock market crash. They had a dust bowl. The entire ecosystem of the West just turned against everybody. And there were these massive, massive clouds of dust that just covered everything, ruined the crops. People died inhaling this stuff. There were clouds of dust going all the way to New York. I mean, if you can imagine, I understand why people may have thought it was the apocalypse then. Just like we see wildfires, we see the state on fire and we're like, wow, this is the end. So that is the crisis period. That is the crisis period that makes a hero. And the awakening period happens at the opposite end of that crisis period. So it sort of shadows it. I imagine the GI generation was like, spiritualism, excuse me, spiritualism? I grew up eating beans out of a trash can. I don't wanna hear about spiritualism. It's a different mindset. It's an entirely different mindset. So that awakening period was children who grew up in privilege they grew up in privilege because their parents were such bosses 
and they rebelled against that privilege by having a spiritual awakening. The 70s were kind of a mess, at least compared to previous eras, because there was stagnation, people didn't really believe in the system that much anymore. We had all sort of political drama. One could make the argument that this political drama was unique to the 70s, and it's not part of some larger metaphysical historical cycle totally understandable. So the unraveling, the 80s, we didn't really know it because we were too young, but the 80s were also kind of messy. Morning in America, uh, uh. go back and watch They Live because that is set in the morning in America period. And we see that this morning in America was just a facade. The final period in which we have lived most of our lives, at least if uh, my stats are to be believed, we have lived most of our lives in a crisis period. This will not come as a shock to many of you because look around. It is a mess outside. It is a mess and it has been a mess nearly all of our lives. How long has this crisis lasted? The culture war started before 9-11 even. The culture war was happening in the 90s. Then we had 9-11. Then we had the stock market crash. Well, we had two wars as well. It fell apart. So 9-11, two foreign wars that were about something, but they really weren't about anything. Stock market crash. Should I say the complete takeover of our institutions by moneyed interest? Is that too cynical or is that accurate? Protests, the riots, some people call them riots, some people call them protests. 2015 to at least 2020, we've had severe civil unrest. I'm not even going to mention the election of billionaire playboy Donald Trump. Donald Trump was president and now we're in the middle of a and everyone seems to have lost their mind, lost their marbles. When I say crisis, I mean crisis. Now, I do not know what is going to happen to bring us out of this crisis. In this book, they actually say that the crisis will end in about 2026. Since I have seen interviews on YouTube with Howe, and he says that the crisis will last up until 2030 or so, anything could happen. With the way this past year has gone and the way we have handled this, I don't put anything past us. We seem to be able to screw things up to the nth degree. I would like to say as a millennial that I am over this crisis and I am willing to put in whatever work it takes to bring us out the other side. Looking around at other millennials, I am deeply unsure if um, as a generation, we are up to the task. I'm just gonna be perfectly honest. I think half of us really have it together and we're using the internet to our benefit and we're using it to better ourselves and to make us healthier people and to make our relationships stronger. And I see that the other half are using it as an excuse to become weaker. So I don't know if this um, self-pity and this self-loathing and this uh, doubling down into weakness that we have seen recently are millennials or they are the I generation as Jonathan Haidt likes to call them. They would be the new artist generation. So that would be the, the repeat of the silent generation. You let me know in the comments if you think millennials are up for it. If you think we are up to the task of being this hero generation. In the last seculum, the heroes were the GIs and they were the young adults during the crisis and they physically pulled us out of the crisis. So my grandpa, my grandpa was a GI. They fought during World War II. They were the actual fighters. They were not the generals. The GI generation, they built America as we know it. We used to be an industrial power, we used to be a regional power, but the greatest generation made us a world superpower. If you ask a silent generation person what they thought of a GI, what they thought of the greatest generation, they just thought they were the bee's knees. They really thought they were the coolest, baddest people that ever walked the face of this earth, and they kind of were. They were not perfect, but they beat the Nazis. And they fought that war in the last war 
that the military was segregated, World War II. They came back to the United States and they built these massive suburbs. They built an entirely new America, which was also segregated. And they established the United States as a world superpower, an unquestioned world superpower that was also segregated. Okay, so what the GIs did was incredible. However, we need to check some of the nostalgia for the American high because in light of the fact that they put their lives on the line for this country, had every right in the world to expect better treatment when they came back home than they got. But um, that was not to be. And as I said there, when they returned to this country, they found uh, business as usual, the same uh, routine and, and so forth. Uh, things had in no way improved. And they put this country in the ridiculous position of fighting fascism overseas. And, and uh, promoting fascism at home, you know, it's, uh, it was um, hypocritical, uh, you know, typical American hypocrit you know, uh, hypocritical behavior. I think many black people, to own a home, I think that was the, all they could expect. And if they were able to own a home and educate their children too, that was a sort of a plus. But I, I think those were probably the dreams for black people also at this time the united states was wreaking havoc around the world overthrowing regimes and installing puppet governments all in the name of fighting communism in this video i will be ignoring foreign policy because i'm an american and that's what we do and we can't expect our grandparents to have been perfect either that's asking them for too much people in america would be like if we can go to the moon we can do this it's like you know who went to the moon? The GIs. The GIs went to the moon with Operation Paperclip. So mm. the GIs and some Nazi help kind of took us to the moon. But we still went to the moon. Don't try to belittle it at all. We still got to the moon with the help of the Nazis. But we're just going to... Mm. Like I said, they were an impressive foe. That's why we needed their help. They knew how to get to the moon. They probably had some base up there with the aliens. Cutting that part out. But anyway, the GI generation made it to the moon. They built the highways. The greatest generation, it seems like they could have done just about anything they set their minds to. And it's a shame they didn't set their minds to racial integration. It's kind of hard to be like, okay, this generation ends here, and this one starts there, and this one has value. It's like, it all kind of goes together. Although we do see from the birth rates of the boomers and uh, the GIs and the millennials that there, there is a a period where a lot were born so we can say this is a generation but when you really get down to the edges when you really get down to the perimeter you see that there's a lot that just sort of goes into the next one so where is the line drawn the lost generation begat the silent generation which begat generation 13 or gen xers who have since begat the i generation and then we have the major generations, which are the heroes and the prophets. And so the GIs begat the boomers who begat millennials. And all of these generations are rebelling against their parents. So the boomers rebelled against the GIs because they're awful. They can't, they can't even appreciate how much our grandparents worked to give them these white picket fences. They're like, we don't want white picket fences. We want da 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 Do you know how much a white picket fence costs in los angeles a house with a nice white picket fence and a front lawn and a back lawn that's a million dollar house that's a million dollar house you give me a white picket fence any day of the week so long as the neighborhood is racially integrated anyway boomers could not appreciate this so they rebelled and then so us millennials rebel against our parents who are the boomers and the cycle repeats. And so we say, we want the white picket fence. Y'all are dumb. We want a white picket fence. You ruined it for us. You think we can make it to the moon? You think millennials could go to the moon? They're saying there's an asteroid coming. We might have to do some adult stuff then. Make it to the asteroid. Gotta go to the asteroid, pull some Armageddon-like stuff. That's the equivalent of making it to the moon. That would make the millennial generation, our generation, straight up heroes. A lot of people doubt millennials, myself included. I think I started this entire thing by saying how much I doubt millennials in my generation and how disappointed I am in my generation and that they would rather watch superhero movies and live vicariously through a fake character than go out and do something impressive on their own. But far be it for me to criticize. I hope we can, I hope we can be heroes. Some great people 
came from the silent generation. MLK, Malcolm X, these are silent generation. If you ask an African-American who was the hero generation in African-American history, a lot of them will say that civil rights generation. But anyway, the silent generation was integral in integrating the United States. It's hard though. It's really hard to say it was this generation or was that generation because we have the older folks during this time were lost generation. And the beatniks during this time were silent generation. And the ruling generation during this time were the GIs. So who did it? Who's gonna take credit for racial integration? They all wanna take credit. Just know that the silent generation, as much as we like to gloss over them, as much as they were ignored during the 20th century, is that they did some really incredible things with integration. And maybe, maybe the greatest generation had a huge part in that as well. Maybe the greatest generation was just tired. We all have to fight battles in our youth. And maybe the greatest generation's battle was Hitler and the silent generation's battle was civil rights. And then the boomers battle was, I guess, stability. Mad about that. I'm coming off as so bitter toward the boomers. I hope a boomer isn't watching, like how dare she? But it is, it's part of the cycle. As a millennial, I must rebel against my parents and my parents were boomers. So I asked a silent generation friend of mine about boomers. She's actually 80 this year. So I said, look, friend, I won't give her name because she may have to disown me later. I said, look, friend, Please tell me about this last seculum. What has happened over this past 80 years? And she said, first off, she loved the GI generation. She thought that the greatest generation were basically superheroes. She did not think much of the boomers. In fact, she had a little sister who was a boomer 10 years younger than her. And she said, this was a different culture. She could not relate to her little sister. She could not relate to their values. And I asked her, okay, so what was the difference between Korea and Vietnam? Why did Vietnam pop off and Korea didn't? And she was like, pop off? Okay, older people don't know what pop off means. I asked why the youth rebelled against Vietnam, but not Korea. She said they didn't see anything bad about America on TV during Korea, and the press supported that war. People trusted the government. They didn't think they would lead them astray. And then you have the invention of TV and a press that's more critical of the government during Vietnam, during the late 60s. So this, this is technology once again, which would go with a linear view of world history instead of uh, this. So this is technology changing things fundamentally. And this technology was television. The television bringing tragedy to your living room. Basically, my friend told me, she said, the kids changed. It is not the boomers fault that they came of age during an unprecedented time of wealth. This, I don't think was promised to the United States. Even though the greatest generation was so impressive, I don't think that it was a foregone conclusion that the America, American empire would be so wealthy. I shouldn't say American empire, but we started to be kind of a little bit of an empire then. It was not a foregone conclusion that the United States would be so wealthy. What happened was the rest of the world was basically destroyed after the Second World War. Some of them had it coming, some of them didn't. But we were left standing, and so we didn't really have much competition for that time. To have that, for the boomers to have that, no other generation has grown up with that much wealth and with parents just that powerful unquestioned world all-star team. The boomers were spoiled. My point is the boomers were spoiled and it's not their fault and we shouldn't begrudge them a great youth. What we can begrudge them is not appreciating all that they had and not handing it to us in the state that it was handed to them. That's the last thing I will say on the boomers in this video over the next two minutes. So let's just qualify that. I'm gonna talk more shit about the boomers, but we cannot begrudge them from being wealthy. That's all. After this period, during the unraveling, the household income stagnated and it has never recovered. So when we're talking about the high, when we're talking about the greatest generation and what they built, their lives, the quality of life was very good and it was shared by the middle class as well. In the 60s, they had the pill. 
And so this enabled a spiritual and sexual revolution because they could have sex, but not for procreation. That's interesting. I would also like to ask the authors about that, that we do see a linear progression of technology in general. It's not this, 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 and this. It's this. We are getting better. However, I'm willing to entertain the idea that our goofy human asses will return to the same place no matter how much effort we put into bettering ourselves. How long that process takes, I have no idea. I find this the funniest model of world history and so likely true. And so while all this is happening, new generation is being born and no one cared. These are the, the 13th generation or the Gen Xers. It's funny because their parents wanted to abort them and they petitioned the Supreme Court and the government so that they could have the right to abort them. And when they got pills that said they didn't even have to have them, they celebrated in the streets and all these women were like, woohoo, we don't have to be dragged down with these stupid little kids anymore. Those little kids were Gen Xers and Gen Xers knew that their parents felt like this. How did they know? The exorcist, omen, in the zeitgeist, there was this idea that little children were evil and we don't want them during this time, during the 70s, the late 60s and the 70s. You think Gen Xers didn't know that? Do you think they didn't see that their parents didn't want them? Like, obviously they knew that, obviously they saw that. Anyway, by the time the 80s rolled around, everyone was over that and they were, they were ready to really have children, children that they wanted, not these like practice children. You know, you get a puppy and you like raise the puppy so that you don't screw up when you have a child. That's my dog. I got him so I don't screw up when I have a child. Anyway, that was the Gen Xers. Those were the puppies. They were like, all right, eh, enough of you. We're going to have our real kids now, the kids that we want. The millennials, the millennials, they actually wanted us to be born. So we were a prize. Now we get new movies. We get the Home Alone movies where it's just like, we like these kids. These kids are good kids. Not like those Gen Xers, ew. It's so sad because the Gen Xers, that's the nomad generation. And we do overlook them. We do forget about them. We're just sort of like, ah, uh, whatever was born between boomers and millennials. But think about this. If student loans get forgiven, they will have been forgiven shortly after Gen Xers paid off all their student loans. Whatever is gonna happen in the next 10 years, it's that generation that's kind of leading us and kind of helping us like the lost generation was helping and leading the GI generation. I respect the process. I like this idea of a cyclical history because it gives us meaning. Yes, I was reading this book. I've actually bought this book for two people now. Two people, one's, both of them are boomers actually. Both of them are boomers. I bought this book because they were like, ah, the millennial, Blah, I don't like them. They're so young and fit and just cocky and we gave them everything and look how they treat us, which is true. Look how I've treated them this whole video. But, um, so I bought this book for two people and they're very down, at least the latest one is very down about the state of the world. And I was like, don't worry about it. We're gonna bring it back. We lose our minds every 80 years or so during a crisis period. We're getting over this crisis period. You just happen to be approaching your elderly years during a time of severe crisis. Anyway, going back to a cyclical version of history versus a linear version of history. I really like the idea, whether or not you believe in a higher power, that we have a purpose being here, even if it's just being part of a larger movement of a generation that's going to do something. There's something to be said for believing what you need to believe to be the best version of yourself. And I, I believe that this kind of gives us hope that if we believe what we need to believe, that okay, it's cyclical, because why not? Basically, when I first started reading this book, I was like, this is so metaphysical. And you know, I don't have a problem with metaphysical. I'm reading this at the same time I'm reading Blavatsky and I mess with Blavatsky. So I'm okay with metaphysical. However, I don't know how okay I am with metaphysical in my history. Do you know what I mean? Because history is more facts. What happened when? And this book is giving it a meaning, ascribing meaning to history. And so I was like, this is like, you know, some of these spiritual books about the changing of the seasons and all these things. They even say, you know, to everything, turn, 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 there is a season, turn. And so I'm like, I, I, is this pseudo history yet? I don't know how much I buy this, but I put this book down maybe a month ago and I'm still thinking about it. 
it has very much affected how I think about history, the state of man, the state of the country, our future has given me hope for our future. And the last note, the last thing I'm going to say on this is that I am over this period of chaos, this crisis period, as he says it. I think it has lasted a lot longer than he said it would last. First, he said 2026. Now he goes on interviews saying 2030. I buy 2030. If we get out of it in 2026, I will be happy. Um, Strauss and Howe claim that the battles to be fought over this next decade are going to be decisive. And they're going to establish a world order in which we will live for the next 80 years, just like happened after World War II. I have not seen the world order established just yet. I've seen attempts at a world order being established right now, but I see those attempts have brought something that is just, we can't build our houses on what we're seeing right now. I know I'm gonna make a lot of people mad, but our heroes can't be too scared to go outside and see the Postmates guy. If you're afraid of the Postmates guy, you're not a hero, full stop, period. So I am not seeing right now that we have established the order that will bring us into the next century. I'm seeing that we have a lot more work to do and I am hoping and praying millennials can do it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this extra long video. I do recommend this book, even if it's not to be taken as the word of God, it is definitely an interesting thing to think about. And the more you think, the better you are. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe.